week we were starting to look at biodiversity, what is it, uh, as well as effects of at least one factor, uh, climate change, uh, that may have detrimental effects, uh, or for some species a positive effect actually, on, uh, on biodiversity. Um, what we'll be looking at today is the so what aspect. Why should we care? Why uh, might biodiversity and especially ecosystem functioning as a whole uh, be important for, uh, for us? We will start today by looking um, basically at the stability of ecosystems and when that fails at what happens, ecological surprises, environmental surprises. We will then follow through uh, into the next lesson and look at what is the effect of failing ecosystem functions or failing ecosystem stability to provide us with, uh, with ecosystem services, basically, um, uh, that we depend on as a society. And what are the costs and benefits of it? And how can we actually start to manage uh, and value uh, ecosystem services in a way that encourages us to protect these basic and essential ecosystem and biodiversity functions? Uh, that we depend on. And then finally, uh, we're going to come back uh, at, at the end of this week and we'll actually look at historical examples of the when things go wrong kind of sort of category. Uh, historical examples where, where civilizations um, or societies have faced such a dramatic decline in ecosystem services, uh, the ones that we just uh, discussed the, uh, the lesson prior, right, the second lesson of this week, um, and the effect that that has on, on, that partic on those particular civilizations. And we can see actually from the examples that at least in some cases, historically, it has uh, been rather painful uh, when, when the env uh, environment declines sufficiently. So let's start uh, now to actually look at ecosystem stability and the, the uh, importance of, uh, of maintaining uh, broad ecosystem functioning. To sort of prime us, let's look at a few examples of when things seem to go wrong. And you're probably all familiar with these things, right? Uh, one of these is very, very prominent, right? Uh, everyone knows that if you do agriculture, there is things called pests, which are basically just species that are also happy that you gave them uh, resources to make a living off of, right? And happen to be their food source. Um, and uh, uh, however, right, they're, they're, they're quite damaging to agricultural productivity. And and you may be uh, familiar uh, with pest outbreaks. Now, we're keeping these in check by and large through pesticides and all sorts of man management strategies, uh, right? But even so, especially when uh, certain bugs get resistant to these pesticides, right? You're probably familiar there can be enormous outbreaks with enormous crop failures as a response. It can be insect species. Of course, the same can be true uh, with plant diseases or other diseases that can take on epidemic uh, proportions, right? Run amok um, and, and have a devastating impact on agricultural productivity. At the same time, you might also realize, well, some of this can actually happen in natural systems too, but there is something, or there seems to be something about agricultural systems, these are also ecosystems, right, that seems to make them more prone to this erratic behavior of species, to this sudden enormous outburst in numbers of, of these pest species uh, that become a problem. Uh, and we find much less of that in ecosystems. In fact, uh, right, it's, it's almost folklore by, by now that ecosystems sort of are in balance, right? Where all the different species are in balance with one another. Well, it turns out not everything is as nice and friendly as that might sound, balancing everything out, right? However, it's by and large true that ecosystems uh, or species within ecosystems are sort of maintained around uh, uh, sort of stable levels, right? There seems to be more stability uh, by and large in natural ecosystems uh, than in artificial ones or mo heavily modified ones such as agricultural systems. A very prominent example, and that's actually the example that we'll come back to at the end of this lesson to really look at uh, uh, the effects uh, on, on, uh, of the various causes that we'll be discussing in a little bit. Um, on ecosystem stability is fisheries collapse in the face of overfishing. And you may have heard of this as well, right? Um, we ha we're increasingly now facing fish stocks uh, that are drastically over depleted. And it's not just that these fish are disappearing slowly as a function of, um, of us fishing more, but in fact, uh, uh, 
with increasing fishing pressure, what we increasingly see is just a drastic drop in productivity in the fish that seems to have come out of nowhere. And in fact, uh, afterwards, the, the system seems to have been changed and degraded in such a way that it, it, it's difficult for at least some of these fish stocks to rebound. Uh, even in the absence or, or severe reduction in fishing pressure. Why might that be? Why do ecosystems respond like that? And so that's the key question, that's the challenge that we'll set ourselves today to understand. Let's first look at a rather simple example of this um, before we start delving into more complex ones. Uh, you're probably all familiar that if you give a population sufficient resources, um, the population will grow and in fact will grow exponentially. So obviously this population growth cannot just continue indefinitely, right? And this is the scary thing actually about our human population growth, which over the 20th century actually has even exceeded exponential population growth. It was super exponential um, uh, population growth. And obviously this can't go on forever. Uh, as we were saying, right, this can only happen if resources are unlimiting. While we're living on a finite planet, there's only a certain amount of resources, food and space, and if you're a plant, light and water, of course, for every organism, right, uh, that is available for growth. And so at some point, it's uh, the surface of the earth or the resources available in a particular habitat is be going to become limiting. And so what's the effect of that? A S-shaped growth, right? A logistic growth curve. So here's the next concept, right? So carrying capacity, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, right, is the maximum number of individuals that can be sustained indefinitely on, on a particular set of resources uh, provided by the environment. And so the carrying capacity is directly determined by what is the rate at which each individual uh, minimally needs resources at um, to survive and to be Right, uh, reproductively active and so forth and so on, um, versus what is the rate at which a particular environment can provide these resources, right? And so the carrying capacity is that population size where the rate of consumption uh, per individuals times all the individuals at that, in that population, right, are the same as the rate at which the environment can provide these resources. At this point, no further population increase is possible uh, without degrading uh, the, the, uh, the resource availability from the environment, right? And so K or the carrying capacity is a crucial um, sort of limit to biological populations. Now that does not mean that one cannot exceed the carrying capacity. We have to remember that the carrying capacity is simply determined by the amount of resources that are available or made available, the rate at which these resources become available to a population uh, by, given by the, a, a certain um, habitat, right, an ecosystem. That is not necessarily a constant number, so this depends on the productivity of other aspects in that ecosystem. And in fact, if, that, if this population, if our population that we're watching now um, is, is, it has a major impact on, on resource demand from the environment, right? The actions of that population can actually themselves alter the carrying capacity, for example, uh, by degrading uh, the, the productivity of the ecosystem. A very common example uh, of this uh, comes from, for example, deer populations that have become historically unchecked or in recent years unchecked by predation, right? All the wolves have been killed and so forth and so on, right? They don't have natural predators anymore. Food resources have, uh, right, galore, especially with agriculture now. So deer populations can really rise uh, in many areas. Deer can be quite destructive at high population density though. There is a lot of trampling of undergrowth going on, a lot of uh, uh, grazing to the point where, where, where all the little seedlings in woodlands, for example, can be grazed clear and clean. Uh, and actually, especially during the rut, uh, deer start to rub their antlers uh, along bark of trees. And so it can actually even damage, severely damage, especially at high population densities, can severely damage um, even trees in woodland environments. And so one of the consequences of this is at very high deer densities, it can actually reduce the, um, the ability of the, of the plants, in, so the autotrophs, right, in a particular ecosystem, to provide the necessary resources, even not just for other species, but also for that deer population itself. So here's an example of, of a population that may not even have exceeded its carrying capacity, but because of its effects on the plants, uh, or the, right, the, the, the um, 
the producers in that particular ecosystem, as the population is rising, carrying capacity, what may have seemed initially very high, can actually be degraded and come down. And it can in fact come down so far that that poor deer population can in fact even find itself high and dry above that, uh, that dropping carrying capacity, which causes huge trouble for that deer population, right? Now, if that deer population found itself ab uh, above it, right, obviously uh, uh, the population size is now going to, to uh, drop. But even now, when the deer population can come back up, uh, unless there is further changes to the, uh, uh, to the ecosystem, this, the ecosystem can remain in this degraded state by, the, by, the, by this continued grazing of the surviving and now, uh, uh, again, growing deer population, so that the carrying capacity in that ecosystem can be permanently reduced or right, semi-permanently uh, reduced. So this is a very simple example of a, an environmental surprise. You may have looked initially at that ecosystem of, uh, when the deer populations were sort of held under control and estimated that, well, given this abundance of resources in the environment, right, um, there could be you know, such and such a level of deer, maybe a very high estimate of the population of deer. But it turns out because of the other effects of deer on the environment that continually degrade the environment as deer populations rise, this may actually have resulted in an overestimate because we did not take into account the, uh, the effect of deer on degrading basic what is an ecosystem service, right? An ecosystem functioning, in this case, primary productivity in that ecosystem due to disturbance uh, dropping. Uh, and and uh, hence resulting in a big surprise. You can't actually maintain that many deer as you may have initially um, uh, thought you could. This is a very important lesson also as we will see when we're going into the second unit uh, for human uh, uh, ecosystems, for agricultural ecosystems globally. The big question, uh, if you remember from the first week, right from the documentary, how many people can live on planet Earth? Well, it is, it, it's a, a function of multiple components. And one of the things we really have to investigate is how much are we actually degrading basic ecosystem functioning, such as primary productivity due to climate change, due to degrading uh, or degradation of soils, uh, that re uh, the inavailability uh, in the future of certain kinds of fertilizers, such as phosphorus, right, that are uh, uh, drawn from limited non-renewable resources, uh, that may actually in the future reduce uh, our ability to produce food. And so the current estimates of, com uh, of, of total population size may actually be an overestimate, just like we may have initially overestimated how many deer could be maintained in a particular ecosystem. So very important lesson from, from, from very basic biology. So let's start looking at a little bit more complicated systems. Obviously, um, communities or ecosystems uh, don't just consist of one species. Species do not just exist in a vacuum or in pairs, right, with deer and plants kind of sort of scenario. But obviously, right, we have a much more complicated web of interacting organisms, what we call communities of organisms. So a community is a set of species that live in a particular uh, geographic area that are actively engaged with one another and are interacting with one another. And so if you look at this very simplistic uh, uh, ecosystem that is illustrated here, um, try to figure out what are all the different ways in which these different species may be interacting with one another. What can all of the different community interactions be in this simple ecosystem? So you probably came up with a whole number of different kinds of ecological interactions, right? Predation is an obvious one, where we have one organism that is eating a different organism, right? And we can actually um, uh, designate these sorts of ecological interactions with little uh, signs in a way, right? Little monikers, uh, such as plus and minuses, right? So a, pre a predatory interaction can be designated as a plus minus a positive slash negative interaction because it's good for one species, right? Good for one in, uh, interacting species, the one that's eating and chomping away at a different one. 
And it's clearly not the best of days for the other one that is being eaten, right? So for that one, it's a negative interaction. So it's a plus minus interaction is how we designate this. Predation obviously reduces the population size of any given species uh, uh, that is a prey to that predator in the environment, right? And so predation can actually be severe enough that it reduces the total population size of species far below their carrying capacity. At which point the environment itself, the resources made available by the environment itself may actually not become limiting. So predation can play a really crucial role in stabilizing natural ecosystems by keeping populations in check and far below their carrying capacity. In fact, it is likely that predation combined with diseases and parasites, for example, that also reduce population uh, size and growth of, of organisms, may be, play a fundamental role in the fact that this world is by and large pretty green, right? All of the plant matter is not simply eaten away. This is largely because of plant defenses, of course, as well, but in not as, as insignificant part, also because uh, herbivore populations are in fact kept in check far below the level at which they start to degrade the ecosystem and the productivity of the ecosystem to an extent that they, the, their populations themselves becomes food limited. Any community of course is organized into a, uh, a food web as, a, as it were, right? So if we just simplify this down and, and now look at a food chain, so just write a, a link of different species, each one is eaten by the, uh, by the one on the higher trophic level above it. Right, so in this case here, we come to the kelp forest in the Northwest Pacific region, right? And so we have a simple system where we have giant kelp, which are the primary producers in this ecosystem, right? And they're eaten by sea urchins, uh, which are the herbivores here, um, right? But the sea urchins themselves are being eaten uh, by um, the predator in this, uh, in this ecosystem, which are the sea otters. So a very simple food chain, as it were. So they're obviously eating one another, so we know what the effects of these are, right? Uh, uh, predator to prey interactions are always uh, plus minus, right? And so the effect of sea urchin, uh, of the sea urchin population on the giant kelp population is obviously a negative one. The more sea urchins there are, the fewer kelp, or the less uh, sea urchins there are, the more kelp, right? So there's a negative effect on the kelp. And obviously the sea otters have the same effect on the sea urchins, right? It's also a negative effect. Uh, of, this, of the sea otters on the sea urchin population. The question to you now is, what is actually the effect of the sea otters on the giant kelp? So even though the sea otters have absolutely nothing to do with the kelp, they don't interact with the kelp much by, uh, by and large at all. Sometimes they roll themselves up in them to sleep, but it doesn't harm the kelp, right? So they're not doing anything either really beneficial uh, directly to the kelp uh, or, or negative by eating it. Uh, however, they do interact with the kelp quite strongly indirectly. Uh, and they do so by uh, interacting with the herbivore of that kelp. So obviously, as the, uh, if a sea otter population increases in population size, it hammers the herbivore in that ecosystem, uh, the sea urchin, and this has a net positive effect on the giant kelp, right? So basically, the more sea otters in that ecosystem, the more giant kelp as a, as a consequence. This is what we call a trophic cascade, where the effect of one species uh, on, uh, on the next lower one has an effect on the next lower one and so forth and so on, right? O always alternating, uh, which can run all the way down from the top to the very bottom of that particular food chain. This example is not actually just arbitrarily chosen um, because it actually uh, is, a, is a system uh, that has been naturally observed uh, to result in a trophic cascade, for example, that drastically altered ecosystem functioning and ecosystem stability in this case, and changed an ecosystem from one state into a severely altered uh, a, a state. The re so this is, uh, has been playing out in the Pacific Northwest. You may or may not know, uh, but uh, these cute little uh, sea otters actually have very valuable pelts. Uh, it's very, very dense fur and very soft fur, and it, uh, and it really keeps you very, very warm. And so for the past over 100 years, they've really been hit very hard um, by hunting, human hunting, right, for their pelt, for the pelt industry. And so their populations, by and large, in the Pacific Northwest have crashed. Uh, until protective measures were taken. So um, the, the, uh, the sea otter uh, population size 
basically went down in many places to absolutely nothing. And so this had a huge effect actually on uh, the sea urchin population, which has just exploded, which resulted then in a uh, in some cases, complete reduction down to nothing of these giant kelp forests. And it turns out that actually had important consequences for fisheries in that region. And it turns out these giant kelps are actually such hiding places for many young fish, uh, freshly hatched fish. So they act as fish nurseries in a way, uh, which, which uh, for, for many of the species of fish that are actually commercially caught uh, along the Pacific Northwest. So the drastic reduction in kelp forests, uh, simply because sea otters were hunted for their pelts, may actually have directly contributed to a decrease in the fish population sizes um, that fisheries were depending on. So here is an, another example that actually um, takes the same, it's the same basic uh, uh, ecosystem, the same habitat here in the Pacific Northwest, and it adds a few more links into that system. And what I would like you to do is to figure out how this initial per, uh, uh, perturbation that is described in this problem uh, may filter all the way through the system and result in, in, in drastic changes to the productivity of this particular ecosystem. If we have one species, such as these sea otters, that have such a pronounced effect on the stability of an ecosystem, we call this species a keystone species. What this means is that the presence of that species, even if its numbers by and large are not very large compared to many other species, but this species may have a disproportionate effect on that ecosystem to be maintained in its current state. And if you alter that species, such as by deleting it out, by driving it locally extinct, for example, right, um, you may have very large and completely unintended consequences to the eco basic functioning of that ecosystem. And the ecosystem as it stands may actually even collapse, as we saw in the case of uh, uh, sea otter, the effect of, of the reduction of sea otters on the kelp forest environments in, that, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So here's a wonderful example from the Yellowstone Park where uh, many decades of investigation have really looked at the effect of a different keystone species on the habitat in this particular ecosystem. I, I have a link to that video uh, down below and I'd really like you to watch it. It's a real beauty that, uh, and shows uh, basically why we should care in large part about, uh, about healthy ecosystems and particular species, preserving particular species that may play a profound effect and a, a keystone role, as it were, in those ecosystems to maintain healthy populations of many other species. What I'd like you to do then is down below uh, in, that, in that essay box um, uh, to write out uh, all the different interactions that you can uh, uh, find in that particular video and highlighting the effect that changing this uh, population size of this one species, this keystone species, the wolf in this case, has on actually the productivity of uh, the, uh, the ecosystem as a whole. So let's return now to the problem that we set ourselves at the very outset of this lesson, the collapse of fish stock um, and a late recovery following overfishing. And let's see if these very simple sort of lessons that we took away from how um, different species are interacting with one another can actually help us understand uh, what happened. The most famous one of these examples is also the very first time a fish stock had completely collapsed in the 20th century at least due to overfishing uh, and it really hit as a complete surprise. The example here comes from Arctic cod. You may know cod, right? Cod is a very common uh, fish species uh, uh, that you find on your plates. Um, little kids know it as these fish sticks, right? That is uh, typically cod. Um, anything, the Brits know it as fish and chips, right? What comes there is also cod. Many of the breaded kinds of fish is cod, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's a very kind, like fish sandwiches and things like that, right? That you might uh, find at some even fast food restaurants typically is cod. It turns out that the cod population once was extremely numerous um, uh, and then several of its populations have completely declined. When we're looking at the history of these stocks, what we can see is there was a continual high level of, um, uh, of fishing and then an enormous spike. So what you're seeing here is not actually the population size of cod over time, but instead the size of the catch 
So what, what is responsible for this incredible increase dur uh, during the mid-20th century was, it may not come as a surprise, right, was the, uh, was the introduction of large mechanized fishing practices such as trawling, for example, with these enormous nets that can be, simply be swooped behind a ship back and forth and back and forth and catch by and large uh, just about anything that swims in the, uh, uh, um, in the vicinity. Shortly thereafter, uh, there was observed an, an incredible crash in cod populations. Uh, so this is a clear sign of overfishing. Uh, there were restrictions set in place relatively quickly uh, to um, maintain cod populations and, and have them rebound. There was initially a rebound uh, to catch levels uh, that, uh, that allowed catch levels to resume to levels that they were held previously at. Uh, but something about that system seems to have now changed and uh, uh, apparently the cod population was not uh, able anymore to sustain that, uh, that level of fishing pressure that it was able to maintain previously. And a few years thereafter, there was a second collapse of the cod from which the population up to today has not fully recovered. Although by now, in the last few years, there's the first inklings of a partial recovery now of the cod, finally. So let's take a look at how we can diagrammatically show this. In this diagram here, we're looking on the x-axis at basically a level of disturbance, in this case, fishing pressure from low on the left-hand side of the, of the x-axis to high fishing pressures on the right side. Historically, there have been variations in fishing pressure, and they did seem to, to have an effect on the cod population at sort of moderate levels. Um, this is now getting into this uh, linear thinking of humans, basically, right, that, that, that we humans are very prone to. Um, and so uh, there was historically observed a decline in the ecosystem function, in this case, uh, the productivity of cod, for example, in this ecosystem with respect to fishing pressure. And uh, it was initially assumed that, uh, that given the still high concentration of cod in that particular ecosystem, higher and higher fishing pressure would be able to be maintained at, uh, a, at a, um, sort of at a linear scale, right, before we completely deplete the cod population. It turns out that is not what happened, but instead a tipping point was reached uh, beyond which the cod population very suddenly plummeted and completely collapsed. We also already said in general that these nonlinear behaviors with threshold-like responses uh, are largely due to changes in the interactions of various comp uh, components of the system, right? Various positive and negative feedback mechanisms, for example, that may be changed. This is illustrated on this graph here, sort of diagrammatically with a ball on a hilly landscape, right? And so we have one state that has sort of uh, is elevated. We can think of that as ecosystem functioning, right? So here's one aspect of the ecosystem, one ecosystem function, uh, maybe productivity, plant productivity or, or something, right? Or fish productivity, if we're thinking of fisheries, right? Um, that is at a pretty high level. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a little bump here also in the way. So if we now push that ball a little bit, right, so we per perturb the system, but the ball sort of just sloshes back and forth, right, and, uh, and falls back into its uh, original state, right? So this, this, this perturb, uh, uh, perturbing that system did not really result in a major change. This is a hallmark, of course, if you remember, of negative feedback loops, right, that are self-correcting, that if we push a system sort of out of balance a little bit, there's these negative feedback mechanisms that can push it right back. That threshold-like response now is the equivalent of chain taking a driver and pushing the system or disturbing the system sufficiently uh, that it is pushed beyond where uh, these negative feedback mechanisms can simply return it to its previous state. And so the equivalent in our example here is giving that ball a shove that is strong enough that it sort of pushes the ball over that hump and the ball now rolls back down, does not go to its previous, right? Now it's on the other side of that little hump in the way and it just rolls back down and we're in a different system. Now this is a system where uh, if we're take, leaving that, that ball analogy aside and returning to our ecosystems, where actually the interactions between organisms in that ecosystem have fundamentally changed. There may also be more negative feedback loops, right, that now maintain that uh, ecosystem or ecological state uh, in a different stable state in a different equilibrium state, as it were, right? But because the, the interactions themselves have been altered, that state is now different. And in fact, it may turn out that it's difficult 
because now we're in a different stable state, right, with different negative feedback loops, it may actually be difficult to get that system to return into its previous state. So we can show this diagrammatically here, where at low to intermediate disturbance, we're in a fish-dominated state. And then at, as we increase the fishing pressure, very suddenly uh, we, we hit a threshold where a, a different group of species, in this case jellyfish, start to be ecologically released, as it were, and can increase in numbers dramatically in this particular system as they're not limited by their own predators anymore and have incredible amounts of food resources now available. So what about recovery? Why is it that if we're now saying, oh, oh, right, we got into a situation that we didn't want to be in, we have our stocks collapse, we didn't totally drive cod to extinction, right? There were still cod in the, in this, in the ocean. So how about putting a fishing ban in place and allowing the system simply to recover, allowing these, these baby cod to, uh, to start uh, multiplying or growing up, right, and then, and then reproducing themselves and multiplying, and uh, we should be coming back, right? So what was found, however, is that Despite the, f the increase in fishing bans and quotas on the, on the cod uh, to, in an attempt to allow them to come back, by and large, this recovery was very slow and in some places even absent uh, in, in, in cod as well as actually in other uh, as, uh, fish species in different areas as well. And so somehow we now uh, are entering a system or have entered an, a state, an ecosystem state, where we got stuck in this degraded uh, system. How can we explain this? In this particular case, what is happening is that the uh, jellyfish themselves actually are predators as well. Uh, of course, they cannot eat large uh, fish like cod, but what they can eat is many planktonic species, little zooplankton, little shrimp-like things, right, that's, uh, that swim around, that actually are at the basis uh, um, of the food chain, both for small cod, baby cod, that eat that eat these, as well as some of the smaller fish species uh, that large cod uh, are, are feeding on. So by increasing the jellyfish population, the food resources actually for cod themselves are being reduced in a particular ecosystem. And what is more, these jellyfish, right, with their stinging cells and so forth and so on, right, I, I, as they're capturing the zooplankton, what is part of that is actually even fish larvae. So if the jellyfish populations increase to very high density, they themselves can actually have a negative effect through direct predation on juvenile or very small, right, uh, 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 fish larvae of cod themselves and hence keep them through predation at a low population density directly as well as, as we just said, right, indirectly through uh, preying also on the food resources. So what we're actually finding is that once we're in this degraded state, we actually fundamentally change the ecological interactions in this ecosystem, where simply reducing our initial fishing pressure may not be sufficient to bring the system back out of that degraded state. Because now there's negative feedback loops, in this case through predation of jellyfish, both on the plankton as well as on the baby uh, codfish, right, that maintain uh, 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 the ecosystem in, in the jellyfish dominated state. So what it actually takes to come back to that more productive system is a much more drastic reduction in disturbance and perhaps even measures to try to, to reduce, in this case, for example, jellyfish populations, et cetera, or maybe to, to help and foster um, traditional measures, the, the cod population, to return us into the more productive, in this case, fish-dominated state.